So growing up during the Great Depression and World War II, my grandmother would preserve her green beans. She did do some canning, but leather britches was one of the predominant ways that they have been preserving green beans in the Appalachia Mountains, and I'm sure even further back for hundreds of years, way before the invention of canning. So when the beans are ready for harvest, and these are a pole, which we have on a trellis system, green bean that my family has been saving for over a hundred years, and my grandparents brought with them to Washington State from Avery County, North Carolina, in about 1940 is when they moved out here, but they've been seed saving them as far back as I'm aware for hundreds of years. So they do require stringing. So you just harvest them as you would fresh. And then we're going to string these and then we are going to turn them into leather britches. So the great thing about doing leather britches is you do not have to heat up your kitchen with canning. And during the Great Depression, my grandma did can, but they only had so many jars because that was obviously an external cost. And during the heat of summer, all they had was wood stove. So the only way that she was able to can was by building a fire. Not only does that get extremely hot in summertime, but also fire danger even back then, once you hit into August, which is when the beans really start to come on here, that also becomes a danger. So using this method of doing the leather britches was really great for both keeping the heat out of the kitchen and not having to worry about having a canner and or enough jars in order to preserve the harvest. So if you are doing a string bean variety, you definitely want to string these first because when it comes time to cook them, there is not going to be an easy way for you to string them and nobody likes to eat the strings. That is one thing when I was teaching my kids how to string beans and snap them when they were little is I would make them go back if they had not completely strung a bean and was trying to just get through it in a hurry. Because you know if you've ever ate beans before that were not stringed all of the way and you get one of those strings, it is not a pleasant thing in the mouth. I mean, it's not horrible, but it's just like kind of getting a piece of hair or floss in there. So we're gonna get these strung. And then I'll show you the next part. So I like to use quilting thread and then I double it just because depending on how big you're making these and usually about two to three feet, if you go beyond that and try to make one longer, it's just a lot of weight for one string to be able to handle. And then when you go to cook them, you most likely won't be cooking that large volume. So it's kind of stringing enough that is going to feed you and your family for a meal and doing them up that way. So I like to, I have an older needle I don't like to use my really good new sharp needles. This one's been through a lot of them, so I just kind of have one in reserve that I use. And then we're just gonna get a knot tied on the end. And you do wanna make sure that it's kind of a larger knot because you are going through beans, not thread. And if you don't have that knot at the end big enough, then the beans are just gonna come sliding right off the end and go right over your knot. That one looks like I just pulled it out. It was looking big enough <laughs> until I pulled on it. There we go. Okay, and then I like to use a thimble and I love these leather thimbles. I never really liked the metal ones, but I love using these. this leather one. This is my quilting thimble actually. So you're just gonna take your bean and you're just gonna take your needle and you're just gonna pierce it right in the center. And if you don't get it directly in the center, like don't worry about it, not that big of a deal. But we wanna kind of push 
push down on that just to make sure that that knot is going to hold and it's not gonna pull right through the bean. It does help too if you actually pierce one of the beans that, that are developing inside the pod rather than just the green fleshy part because that's gonna help anchor it. So this is great to do in the evening. It's kind of like one of those mindless, almost mindless tacks. I actually find it really calming. Um, but I also like to quilt and I like to crochet because I find that that has the same effects. Oops, I got the end of the bean there. Okay, so here we have, this is a smaller one, but that's fine. And then I just like to loop this around so that I have got something to put on my hanging hook. So obviously in the middle of August, we do not have a wood going, the wood stove going, but this is where I have all of my hooks. And you can see I've got my lavender and yarrow and stuff drying here. And this was a batch that I did two weeks ago. So you can see the difference here. This is one that I did two weeks ago. It's definitely beginning to wilt. It's beginning to shrivel up, turn brown a little bit, but this is nowhere near being done. So depending on the humidity and the heat where you have these drying, it will definitely take a while. When it's fully dried, these will be like a yellow, light brand tan and completely shriveled up and dried. Hence the name, they'll kind of look like leather. That's why part of the reason that they call them leather britches. So this one still needs to continue hanging and drying for quite a while and this one does too. But once they are fully dried and are fully turned into leather britches, then don't worry, I will show you how to actually cook and prepare them so that they taste good and are edible. If you wanna learn how to can green beans, you can watch this video for my easy raw pack method. And if you'd like to see more about the history of the leather britches and the house that my dad grew up in and how they did things back in the 30s and 40s, then you can catch this really special interview.